Decida have been completed. Effectively, what the plea is, is the appointment of the judge as the executor of the constructive trust that is the court matter at hand. Prior to you appearing, after the space of 14 days, if there is no executor appointed, you have the right under trust law to claim that they have abandoned the role of executor and that as the only named party, you now name yourself as the executor and deal with the matter. And that's exactly the power of the executor letter because the trust at hand is the court matter. If they do not follow their own duties, which they don't, then you can use their trust law, their rules against them in assuming the role, claiming the role of the office of executor and dealing with the matter. And it is perfectly within your rights. But remember, this is always prior to the physical appearance in court. So we will add this in as a particular measure for, some, for, for all of you to choose. Because the problem with the ecclesiastical deed process, and I'm the first to admit this, is that when you present these things to many of these court officials, they haven't got a clue. They have not got a clue at all. And it is frustrating for me, as it is frustrating for you, as it is frustrating for many. So if trust law and a trust law solution provides some modicum of remedy for your court matters, so be it. And I hope this will assist a number of you, and the aim is to have this up certainly within the next two days. And I'm not advocating the particular letter that was written. In many cases, these arguments that you put your address in the outlying islands or you put it on the moon, for that matter, it, 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 it's meaningless. And a lot of the stuff is gobbledygook, it's meaningless. The point is that they have given notice of a constructive trust and you as a beneficiary, therefore you may respond on the private side of the, of the writ through the post that after a period of, of, I say 14 days, but you could certainly do it after seven days, that without there being a nominated executor being put forward, you assume the role of executor. So there'll be more to discuss that and I look forward to going through that in detail with a number of you, well, with anyone on the call next week. Another one I want to raise is the aspect of the judge's oath. Now, when you look at the notes in terms of how to succeed in court, we say that by rights, if you go down the road of an ecclesiastical deed poll to the court, then what you are claiming is they have no jurisdiction uh, against you whatsoever. Now, that's fine in theory, but again, in practice, we're dealing with a court that is ignorant to their own rules, looks for any single word to run away, and many of the concepts that are raised in the ecclesiastical deed, for, for unfortunately, the vast majority of them is far too complex. So I want to raise another potential remedy to you, which is one that has been extremely important as a point of law in the UK, for example. And it is this. A magistrate and a judge, when requested to present their oath, has no right to deny the request. No right whatsoever. And if a judge does deny the presentation of their oath or the retaking of their oath as an independent judge, which is what they're supposed to be in their own system, then their own rules says they have no jurisdiction. Their own rules tell you they have no jurisdiction. Now, this is another foil to be put in to allow you to have this in your kit bag, this knowledge. 
What we're saying, again, to be absolutely clear, is this. In their own rules, if a judge refuses to acknowledge their oath or take their oath or re represent their oath in court, then this excludes them from hearing or taking oaths. Excludes them by their own rules. And if they cannot take oaths, then they cannot take evidence. And if they can't take evidence, they can't hear a matter. That is actually front and centre in their bylaws and rules that are circulated year after year after year. Every single judge and magistrate knows this. They know it. But they're not following it because they can't keep what they're doing going if you force them to be honest. If they're honest, they can't make money. And they're frightened about what it means. Because so many of them have lost all sense of law that the minute you hold them to account, they feel naked. And they will squirm and refuse. But it is a legitimate remedy to consider. And as I, just to put it in context again, so that we, we're not mixing things up and writing an ecclesiastical deed off to a court and then doing this, these notes will be added in and the context of how to consider these important issues will also be put in there. And I look forward next week again to be able to go through with you by referring to those pages on the importance of requesting the judge if they have totally and utterly refused to acknowledge that they have no jurisdiction over you and push forward, then you have every right every right then to follow up and say your worship um, may we please see your oath may we please see your oath of office or if not may you please uh, restate your oath uh, as an independent judge of course the judge is going to say no dig, let them dig their hole and I know that many of you that have thought about words have gone into court and have been faced with the absolute steamrolling of a, of a matter that is over in five minutes. But what's happening because of people like you, because of people who are willing now to take a stand and, and realise now that enough's enough and to stand there in honour and to learn and become competent with the foundations of law is that it is helping expose these people as nothing more than pirates and criminals. And the law, as we said earlier, has been severed from their claws. People now see that they do not represent the law. And that is a major point of history. Well, let's talk about some of the groups and, and some of the handover quickly as we move forward. And I want to thank those of you that have already chosen to step up and help in these groups that are working on completing the codes of law. Now, I've done a number of audios on these codes of law, but just to put them in context again, if you were to look at the overall structure of Eucadia law, the canons can be viewed as really nothing more than maxims. They're the maxims, the principles of the law. The charters, then, is how those maxims are interpreted, and therefore the charters really can be viewed as policy, how to interpret the maxims. Then we get to the practical front edge of the use of the law, and that's procedures. So it's a process and a form, usually. Almost every process will have some kind of form, and that is the codes. The codes then define the processes. Now, I'm not an expert in education. I'm not an expert in, in health. I'm certainly not an expert in energy or in finance or any of these areas, but many of you are. Many of you have spent years of your professional lives and in many cases interests in these areas and you have enormous knowledge to share. The truth is that there has been little over time serious investment in working out how to structure health into a sustainable model, not just simply 
how to placate special interests, but how should a health system run efficiently? How should it run? How should it be sustainable? Now, I'm not going to go into some of the dialogues there because I've picked a, a touchy subject and the monologue goes through a number of those points, a number of the natural corruptions that now exist in, uh, in the area of health, but it could equally apply to education or the environment. So in these areas, I hope that you accept the invitation and if you don't, at least encourage people that you know who have expertise to help complete these codes. This is an open source model and whilst there is no formal structure because it is going to be up to the communities to approve these codes, I hope you do step up and, and help in the development of these codes of law. So thank you to those that have started and in the coming week I'm calling out tonight please for those with IT skills to step forward. We've had a number step forward but it hasn't really progressed beyond that. I hope that we, we can get people who have an interest in IT to come forward. I hope those of you that have an interest in education will come forward. There is a Skype group already on energy and I hope those of you that have an interest in energy will come forward. And the environment will come forward. There are 33 codes of law in all and a number of them have been completed to a first draft but every one of them needs to be reviewed by the communities when they come together as a group and it will be up to you to decide the finalisation and the ratification of these, not me or anyone else. There is no elite group. I repeat that because I know that this is one of the, the rumours that sometimes gets thrown around. There is no elite group and if you're working on these codes whilst it is a privilege and it is a deeply respected and honour for you to help in this. There is no official structure because at the end of the day it will be the official structures of the communities that ratify it, as it has to be. So that is the groups in a very practical area of handover. Now I want to talk about the subject of enforcement. So in the remaining time we've got I want to talk about enforcement important insights of name and structure, uh, the progress on the planning of communities and money and as I said to you some important insights basing back to the fact that the New World Order already has blown itself up in the 20th century and we need to understand that history. So let's talk about enforcement. When we are facing court, the loss of our home, prison, uh, the imminent danger of paramilitary forces. It, it's very hard, to, as I said before, to think about philosophy and ideas as, as anything other than something that you can really entertain when everything else is solved, but until then it's a bit of a distraction. So when you look at enforcement, for example, on claims of land, it's very hard to, to conceive that esoteric ideas actually are more powerful than the forces that police them. So if you look at one of the arguments that is put forward against Eucadia time again, and, and it's not an unreasonable argument to be put forward if you view the world the way we're taught to believe and view the world, the argument time again is this is great, this is a great idea, great to be part of this, but at the end of the day Where's the enforcement? Well, let's take a, a slight deviation here and let's look at a key piece of Roman law that is embedded in the Jesuit model today of having provinces around the world. Now under the Roman system, they took the ancient Celtic idea of possession being the law and usurped it by saying when a location had been conquered, it wasn't that you possessed the property, it was the fact that you occupied a record in their register that gave you the right of ownership. Which is why we place so much emphasis on those magic pieces of paper they call title and why we depreciate the power of holding possession of the property we're in. It's why when we go to court the court focuses on those little pieces of paper 
in those old dusty registers as being all important 